as Siobhan mentioned there, um, I work within the Nanolab Centre within DIT and within the School of Physics. And um, you'll also notice, just like uh, Fiona, I haven't put the new title on the slide um, for the School of Physics. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is nanotechnology. And I want to give you an overview of nanotechnology so you can go back to your students in your class and discuss nanotechnology with them in an open and clear debate. Um, there's a number of things we have to consider first. And the first thing is the definition of nanotechnology, that concept of nanotechnology. What it is, it was first defined by Nuro Taganucci in 1974. And what he said was that nanotechnology consists of processing, separation, deformation, and consolidation of materials, atom by atom or molecule by molecule. It's a very simple definition, and it still holds true today. In the 4th century BC, Democritus said almost exactly the same thing. So it's something that we've been thinking about for a long time. If you look at a little simulation there, which seems to have stopped, what happens is that we take, a, say, a gram of silicon as an example, and we break that into its constituent components. We take the atoms that are at the core of that silicon and we expose them to the surface. So we get a significantly increased reactivity pound for pound for that, sorry, physicist, gram for gram, uh, for that particular entity. So we increase the reactivity, we increase the surface to volume ratio. We also decrease the particle size, and when we decrease that particle size, the properties of the atoms and the molecules come to the surface, and we start to see quantum effects, quantum confinement. We start to see changes in the thermal properties, the electronic properties, the melting points will change. Now, they're not unique properties, and people often say, oh, nanoparticles have unique properties. They don't, okay? They have the same properties that any other material has, it's just that when we bring that size down, we start to see different effects for the same material that we don't see in the bulk okay, of that same material. We can tune those properties with respect to size. So things like quantum dots, we can go from red down to blue by just changing the size of the particle. Okay, very simple, but not very easy to do. And the reason it's not very easy to do is because we're here in this nano scale. We're there about 100 nanometers or less. Now, not exclusively 100 nanometers, but roughly 100 nanometers and down. So that's in the range of viruses, proteins, and right down the end there are things like DNA strands, carbon-60 molecules, okay? So we're really pushing the boundaries of the technologies and the tools that we have to process things on that scale. To give a concept, the, often that's off, the phrase that's often bandied out is that if you take a human hair here around the 0.1 millimeter, if you take that human hair and you think, what's a nanometer in comparison to that? It's 100,000 times smaller. It's 10 million times smaller than a bee, okay? So it's absolute minute levels we're working on. In other scales that I wanna use as a sort of a guide throughout the talk is to look at the misconceptions of nanotechnology. There's a vast number of misconceptions out there, okay? So for example, what are nanobots? What is the electronics industry? Other things, where we find the products. So we're gonna go through these hopefully in the next few minutes and see some of them. That says there's many, many misconceptions. These are only four that I'm gonna highlight for today. So if we consider nanobots and gray goo. Now most people when they talk about nanotechnology don't like talking about nanobots, okay? But is a fact or fiction? So I'm gonna throw it out. Who suggests fact or fiction? Just like your own students, no one's willing to stick their hand up. Um, well, let's look at the facts. Prince Charles in sort of around 2007, I think it was, came out and says that nanobots are going to turn the, the earth to grey goo. Okay, that's where the phrase goo, grey goo came from. And that caught the media's attention and people freaked out. Okay, about a week later he apologised. Um, and Nature Nanotechnology, we can forgive him because he's not a scientist, but Nature Nanotechnology we cannot forgive. Okay, one of the top publications. When they commissioned and published this image here. Okay? It was done in uh, conjunction with the German Science Foundation. And basically what they thought would they do is they'd promote the idea of nanoscience and nanomedicine in particular. Now, an alien looking craft with huge pinchers grabbing a red blood cell and injecting an unknown liquid into it doesn't install much confidence in me, but I'm not marketing and I'm not a psychologist. So I don't really know. What about yourselves? Do you think that's going to install any we need a lot more coffee in the room, I think. Um, science fiction grabbed onto this. Science fiction loved it, okay? They ran with it. And we've seen nanotechnology and nanobots come into scientific, uh, science fiction aspects all through the sort of 2000s. Most of our superheroes have been invented by nanobots, nanomedicines, and no longer radiation. When did that happen? When did Stan Lee change them all, okay? So, is it possible? Can we produce nanobots? Well, we can produce 
targeted drug deliveries. We can produce entities that will release materials in Pacific sites, but they're passive. They have no processing capabilities. They are affected by the local chemical environment. That might be pH, it might be temperature, it might be excitation using certain wavelength. Okay? They're completely harmless and they do very little other than mo most pharmaceuticals do. On the micro scale, we can produce moving parts and quite readily produce moving parts. But when we go from the micro scale down to the nano scale, viscous forces go up almost exponentially. So we can't get the movement that we require and we can't pair these things to enhance their movement. So the reality is we can produce microbots but not nanobots. And Professor Farnes word if anyone so what's in the two? Microscopic nanobots. Okay, so the contradictory professor, as always, microscopic nanobots. So the answer is no, we can't produce nanobots. So our scales has tilted slightly towards fiction, or towards fact. If you look at the facts, list the products. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to polish eyes in advance. Um, Mom of the madness, I was sick during the week, and um, so I was taking a lot of various neurofence and stuff when I did this slide. So just in case it goes badly wrong, I have to talk very quickly for it. We're going to look at the products that are available in the nano market at the minute. There's thousands of them. There's about 17,000 separate product lines, which I can't go through individually. So we're going to try and do it in this video. So if we start off in the nano world, we come out from the body, we start looking at the proteins, the biomolecules that are in there. Most nano products happen at that level. Okay? So nanomedicine occurs there. We start to see things like defective cells, cancer cells, things that Fiona was talking about. We can interrupt those biochemical processes. As we come out of the body, then we're going to start seeing things like sustainable energies, renewable energies, satellite communications, space race. When we look there, we see astronauts on their spacewalk any second now because we're going too quick. There he is, okay? We have to make sure that he's got protection against thermal radiation, but we have to keep the payloads light. We need to look at the semiconductor industry, semiconductor fabrication, hydrogen storage for the space race, but also for our cars. We need to consider how this is going to affect the environment. This passes down to automobiles, to life, to sports goods. One of the biggest areas for nanotechnology is health and fitness. Um, from microfiber, you can't come into a sports shop these days if you don't see nanoplastic all over it. Communication, some of us watch the Olympics on mobile phones, tuning in on various bits and pieces. This would not be possible without advances in nanotechnology. Take a breather because it went too fast. Don't know why they're playing football. Um, nature is the biggest provider of examples of nanotechnology. And butterflies in particular have scales on it that they can tilt and they can change the color of their actual wings. Now, that's basically nanophotonics. Now, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is nanofuel technology, and it's one of the most lethal areas that nanotechnology is creeping in because it's unregulated. If you think, if you think something like genetically modified foods were bad, nanofoods could be twice as bad. Okay, but they have huge benefits, and we need to keep that in mind. It's the unregulation of that. Now we can breathe again. Um, so there's lots of products. It's fact. Okay, what about the electronics industry? A lot of people associate nano with electronics. And as physicists, most of us here probably think, you know, oh, well, that's probably materials and electronics is the main area. Well, it's not, but let's have a look and see what they say. Anyway, 1947, Bell Labs produced the first transistor. It was a gold con two gold contacts and a piece of germanium in there. Um, it was about the size of a grapefruit. Okay? Within six months, they did that, and I think it was December 1947, they announced that. But June 1948, they were actually commercially selling a transistor that was about the size of a two euro coin. In the next coming decades, nothing really changed. They changed the design, shrank it a little, went down to about the five cent coin. But what actually has happened since then has been quite remarkable. In around the 1970s, we had integrated circuit technology really taking hold, the microprocessors taking hold. We jumped in the early 70s from about 10, 15, 20 transistors per device up to a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand. In the 80s, we started hitting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. In the 90s, we started hitting higher hundreds of thousands, starting hitting millions. Some of you might remember the Pentium chips and so on. In the 2000s, the mid-2000s, we got to the stage where we were producing transistor elements on the order of the uh, influenza virus, about 100 nanometers. Okay? Mid-2000s, we were halfway down further. In 2014, Intel announced a 14 nanometer chip, or transistor. That's working on roughly a tenth the scale of the influenza virus. Okay? That pushed the number of chips or the number of transistors per chip to 7.2 billion okay, on a single chip. When you consider less than 50 years ago, we were looking at tens and fives. Okay? Um, how did they do it? 
Well, they, if we look first, they use this thing called the FinFET, or Intel call it the Trigate. And we look first at a standard FET. What we have here is our source, our drain, okay? And sorry, you just can't see me pointing there. It's the laser pointer there. So we have our, I think it's not working. Oh, yeah. So we have our source, our drain there, and across here we have our metal gate and we have our oxide layers and our silicon well there. So when we start the little video there, okay, this is kindly donated or ripped off from Intel, um, but basically we see our channel working, okay? So that's in the on state, we get conduction across there, okay? Now, key objective is that when it's in the on state that we have minimum current flowing, or maximum current flowing. In the off state, we want minimum current flowing. So there we stop the current, and then we want to have fast switching. That's the key of transistors, quick switching, okay? So we can do that processing, okay? Now, that conduction path is planar, okay? And only goes so far into the material. What Intel realized was that if they basically extend that path up, flip it on its side, bring it up, and wrap the gate electrode around it, they get significantly more control over those electrons moving through, but they also get a significant decrease in the power consumption, okay? Now, that design there has set the standard. With that design, they were able to get to 22 nanometers, okay? Um, <coughs> Okay? And there's not just one of those fins, there's a multiple array of those fins. They're separated by about 60 nanometers for the 22 nanometer device. When we go to push that further, they went to 14 nanometers. Quite simple design. They shrunk the thickness and they made it taller. Okay? So they stretched it. Okay? Now, that had some complications, those fears of what's going to happen, electron diffusion, thermal diffusion. Tunneling will come play because you've got a voltage across a dielectric. You now got the and a very thin dielectric. You now got the conditions set, suitable for tunneling. How did they avoid that? Well, they suddenly realised that they needed a hell of a lot less current when they had that, or less voltage. Apologies, when they had that, so they reduced a lot of the difficulties. Okay, um, so basically, they also found that was much more efficient. So they needed less fins. So they're able to shrink the device, shrink the actual chip, and get higher efficiency and higher processing power. Now, what that actually means for us. Ah, where's my laser? What that means for us is that we have electronic devices that don't get working. Um, like the iPhone S, the Galaxy phones, the netbooks, all of which are using this 14 nanometer chip. IBM have produced a 7 nanometer chip, okay? Um, but the, they haven't marketed it just yet. Um, what's it mean? Higher performance, lower power consumption. It means we can start using this in real world technologies. So if we look here, there's a fiber optic there, it's a sub-wavelength fiber optic wrapped around a human hair. Okay? That's where we're, that was 2003. Okay? We're at the stage where we can now use that because we have the processing power to pull the information out of the other end. Most fiber optic delays are because the processing, the, the electronics wear it down at the end. Wearable technology has become much more realistic. Lab on a chip sensors have made some impacts, but nowhere near as much. If we have the processing power from shorter and narrower FinFETs, but then we're going to get significant capabilities there. Virtual reality devices are making a big inway at the moment as well. After that, who knows? It says IBM have a 7 nanometer chip in trial at the moment. Intel, interestingly, have said they're not going to go with silicon for 7 nanometer. Okay, it's the first time Intel have ever said that they're not going to go with silicon, which is really interesting. What are you going to do in alternatives? Probably something like biomolecular electronics, okay, where they're going to take biological molecules and inorganic molecules, such as, say, carbon nanotubes, and they're going to interconnect them, and they're going to start conduction processes through there. Now, the conduction processes there are very different to bulk semiconductor conduction processes. It relies on free electrons in terms of conjugation and pi electrons. This is work that we did in about 2003. I've moved out of that area, um, but that was 2003. Chances are, with the power of Intel or whatever behind you, the advances are moved on there. So it's going to be really interesting in the next couple of years what Intel and the IBM come up with. So electronics is important, but if we look at this inventory of nano products, which is taken by Penn State University, what we see is nano electronics is only sixth on the list. Life sign and health is number one by a significant amount. The reason it's number one is because of silver. Silver nanoparticles are used in most modern nanotechnology, okay? Particularly colloidal silver. Why? Because it's antimicrobial. If you use silver, um, you can, if, if you consider before penicillin, okay, people were using silver colloidal suspensions for antibiotic purposes. And that's where most of the applications for silver are coming from. So some examples here, we have colloidal silver water here, 
okay, for drinking and for cleaning at the same time. Now, personally, I wouldn't touch it, okay, um, but it is available on, in Australia and it's targeting particularly pregnant mums. Okay, it's called maternal. We have the teddy bear there that has nano silver and coated into the fibres for medical uh, environments, for hospitals and so on, so you don't carry infection. You have toothbrushes, you have contraceptives, you have makeup, you have um, baby's bottles that don't need sterilisation. Okay? These are all products which are marketed and available. Some of them available in Ireland, some of them only via the internet. How does silver induce its antimicrobial properties? Well, it produces ions. And if you remember at the start, it says the more atoms we have at the surface, the more reactive it's going to get. So nanoparticles are great for producing ions. So when we look at this little video, we see that we have a number of bacteria on a surface. We put our silver ions on. They come on to the, the bacteria, and they interact with the thiol groups on the proteins in the cell wall. That perforates the cell wall, it again goes inside and interacts with enzymes and proteins in there and stops the enzyme and protein synthesis. It then can cleave the DNA in there and form these things called free uh, reactive oxygen species, which are essentially free radicals and very, very reactive entities. And that literally kills the bacterial cell. So we're killing the cell in three or four manners, three or four different ways. Some of you may be familiar with things like antibiotics are running out. Penicillin is coming towards the end of its lifespan because so many drugs have become resistant to it. So we have multi-drug resistant bacteria like MRSA, C. diff. What we're trying to do in DIT is combine the, the, the uh, antibiotic effects of our penicillin with our nanomaterials. So we're getting more bang for our book. We're basically trying to kill the bacteria in more than one way. If we don't kill it with the silver, hopefully we've weakened it enough that the antibiotic can do its job. Okay? That's usually via a covalent bond, again with the uh, thiol moiety group on the actual ampicillin and thiol ester. Um, other ways that people are using it in the pharmaceutical sector and in the cosmetic sector and in the food sector are encasing it in those nano compartments, those little cells that we mentioned at the start in terms of nano encapsulation. Now they can use almost like an artificial cell membrane, liposomes, they can use gels, emulsions, polymer encapsulation or micelles, okay? And this adds on telly, I think it's L'Oreal or something, or pronouncing that, micellular. Um, but basically, they're looking at this. This is nanotechnology up front in the public domain in cosmetics, okay? And um, this is an image of um, transparent sun cream with titanium dioxide in it taken through uh, TEM. So you can see the nanoparticles in there. When nanoparticles get into the body though, and don't be worrying about all the text on this slide, it's just the only one I could find. Um, but when you get into the body, they do certain things, okay? They cross membranes and so on. The three things I want you to look at in particular, the yellow ones, blood brain barrier down here at the end. Whoops, sorry. Blood brain barrier down here. Uh, I get it. The blood brain barrier there, sorry, the fetus, blood fetus barrier there, blood brain barrier there, and coming out in the breast milk. If you think of the pregnant mother who's drinking that colloidal silver water, Okay, the silver is crossing the blood-brain barrier, accumulating in the unborn fetus. She then breastfeeds the child when it's born, accumulating silver in the child again. At the same time, the silver is crossing the blood-brain barrier into the child's brain. Okay, and when we think about how much silver is out there, like if I give you an example, Norway anecdotally um, have found 10% increase in silver in their water supply, in their natural waterways. 10%. Now, they didn't suddenly just find a silver mine. Okay, it's from cosmetic products. Okay, and it's nano silver predominantly. So that's particularly frightening. What we found in a study we did and published this year was that silver nanoparticles taken orally at the doses that you'd expect to leach out of silver lunch boxes, lunch boxes that have antimicrobial properties in them, will cross the intestine into the blood at concentrations sufficient to cause an inflammatory response into epithelial cells of your arteries. Okay, an inflation which is sufficient enough to cause arterial sclerosis and is a forerunner of stroke. Okay, this is no surprise, we've seen this before. Okay, as far back as the early 80s, and probably even further with respect to ultrafine particles, diesel emissions, and so on. So this is not unusual. So the timeline for nanotoxicology is quite old, and you can see some of the things there. The one that really triggers, triggered an area to evolve out of nanotoxicology, and why I ended up getting out of sort of nanosensors end, was in 2004, there was a publication that showed that carbon nanotubes, one of the most hyped up nanoparticles of all time cause toxicity in the lungs, which is equivalent to the same type of toxicity we've seen with asbestos. 
Okay? So this really triggered alarm bells and gave birth to an area called nanotoxicology. Now, what nanotoxicology is, it's traditional toxicology, but instead of doing your toxicological assays, you have to physically characterize and chemically characterize your particle before and after the test and during the test. Now, that's where the physicist comes in. Just as a matter of interest, that's uh, polystyrene particles accumulating in a cell. Okay? All toxicological analysis of polystyrene shows it's benign and has no toxicity, but yet it's accumulating within the cell. So what's the role of a physicist in this? Our role is predominantly characterization, <coughs> taking those particles and characterizing them and seeing what they are prior and after and during toxicological tests. Okay? Um, so things like aggregation, crystalline structure, purity, particle size, surface reactivity, they all play a role in how the particle interacts and in toxicity. Okay? We also have a significant role in terms of modeling and predicting how these things. Biological pathways are really complex, so physics can bring a mathematical modeling to it, which very few sciences can. So towards the end now, because Siobhan's looking at our watch, um, we see that when these products, and we mentioned Norway, when these products are finished, when we're finished with our lunchbox that has nano silver implanted in it, we throw it in a recycled bin or we throw it in a landfill. Okay? So we have to consider the impact on the environment as well as on humans. And when we look, we, in DIT we use a multitropic process of different uh, species and we look at. I'm just going to look at the water flea very quickly and show you that when a water flea is exposed to carbon nanotubes, what happens to it? The control there is happily swimming around, then he starts slowing down. Within an hour, we can see that as a gut, because he's transparent, we can see his gut. Okay, they're filter feeders, they filter it in, the gut fills up with black deposits. We can use Raman spectroscopy and we go in and we probe and we see that that's the signature of a carbon nanotube. Okay? After 24 hours in the hour, just approaching 24 hours, he's caked in the material. Okay? These are filter feeders, other species feed on them, so we know we're getting nanoparticles into the food chain. So back to our scales in one sense, can it solve global problems? Well, it can in food, we can get higher nutritional value from less food. We can engineer the food so we're getting much better delivery. Okay? Um, food sensors and so on. Health, nanomedicine is going to revolutionize the medical treatment. Um, Environment, we're kind of not sure there's issues, but if we look after it, we can do a lot of remediation in the environment. You can clean up pollutant areas. These are very reactive, so they can extract out everything from microorganisms to pollutants. Um, so the risks are important, and we need to consider those risks, but the fact and the benefits for nanotechnology far outweigh any of the risks, but the risks could undo it. If you think of GM foods, people's perception of GM food is not great. Okay? But the technology in GM food and the use of GM food is far, far superior than any of the other technologies we've had in the food sector. Yet, it's thrown at the wayside because people are worried about it. Similar with stem cells. We can't let that happen with nanotechnology. So, just to thank the people who work in the Nanolab, uh, School of Physics, and obviously our funders. And if anyone wants any references or anything, please feel free to contact me. And I'll just leave the last word to Professor Farnsworth again. First, let's see if my nanobots have purified the water yet. Oh, the water's as sterile as my milkman trusting father. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Gordon. We have time for one very quick question. You clear that? Yeah, that should be okay. Yes. You might shout to the cam. Yeah, there's a number of things when you go down to that nanoscale, okay, what's going to happen is everything is going to increase dramatically, okay? So if we had the technology to fabricate moving parts on the nanoscale, okay, we're still not going to be able to get them to physically move without a significant power supply, okay? So to give you an example, on the nanoscale, if I was to be swimming in water, okay, at macro scale, it's quite easy. Swimming on the nanoscale, it'd be like swimming in treacle, it'd be like swimming in a really incredibly viscous fluid. So to do that, it's going to take more energy, more energy consumption. And at the moment, anything that we can produce, we can't produce moving parts, that, you know, mechanical moving parts on the nanoscale. But on the micro scale, we can. If we were able to mimic that technology on the nanoscale, we still wouldn't have the power supply necessary to give that tiny, tiny device the sort of skill necessary to translate and move around the body. And so unfortunately, it's not really realistic. I did say in 2001, in my first job, I had to build a lollipop that released nano sensors around the child's body when they were mid to A&E, okay? 
I took the money and was laughing, okay? It is realistic that we can release nanochemicals around the body's child now, okay? But they're targeted and they're passive entities, okay? They can do a certain degree of sensing, but how do you communicate that back outside the body? How does that communicate externally and tell us? So again, you're back to a situation where you're going to be putting something into a body and then waiting for that to come out of the body, be it excreted through urine or whatever it might be, and then do subsequent analysis. And to be honest with you, a triage nurse is cheaper. Okay, and that's what it boils down to. Um, but ultimately, on that nanoscale, everything goes up by an order of magnitude and everything becomes a lot more difficult. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Thank you.